Think about all the things that you take for granted as things that you're allowed to do that the Constitution doesn't explicitly say that you can do, right? Interstate travel. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that the state of Pennsylvania could not say, well, we don't want people coming in from others. They couldn't specify, because of the 14th Amendment, right, probably, that, that Ohioans couldn't come into Pennsylvania, but they could say, you know, so there's nothing in the Constitution necessarily, right, that says that you can do that. Get married. Where in the Constitution does it say that you have the right to do that? It doesn't. So one of the things that we'll get into, and I'm, I'm really not even into the main substance here, but is the question of, and this is a big, long-running issue in American jurisprudence, what rights you've got and who, like where they sort of draw the line about what rights you've got. And as with all legal questions, or I shouldn't say with all, as with a lot of important legal questions, there's any, like whichever side you come down on excludes something that you probably want. So basically it's a, and this is what judges do ideally is that they balance these things. Anyway, so thanks for turning up. My name is John Foster. Most of you probably already know this, but the time that I don't say it is the time that somebody who's never seen me talk and this has actually <laughs> happened to me. I, you know, I, I, I got to the end of a talk, this was a few before COVID, and the guy came up to me in the end and said, so who are you? And, <laughs> and I think with the implication of, and why should we care what you think? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is a legit question. So I've been talking all year about Supreme Court justices, and partly because it's a sort of a fraught topic right now, and I wanted to give people some, a little bit of background on on how the development of the institution. This talk is going to be a little different. I was mentioning this to one of, the, one of our, one of our guest, fellow guests here. For the reason that the other people we're talking about, John Marshall, you know, revolutionary era, John Marshall Harlan and Oliver Wendell Holmes both fought in the Civil War. Earl Warren is living memory for practically, although not entirely, every single person here, myself included. That is to say, I remember when Earl Warren died, uh, and I vaguely remember when he left the court, although I was four or five at the time. Yeah, I'm that old. And the rulings that Earl Warren is involved in are a little sort of closer to us, not only in time, but in terms of the concerns that we have as a society. I titled this talk The Last Boy Scout, which is a ripoff of a movie title, I know. But I think it's really appropriate specifically for Earl Warren, because if you look at his, jur Earl Warren's jurisprudence was not of incredible depth. I mean, which is not to say that it was not great jurisprudence. But he wasn't a legal scholar. He wasn't a constitutional scholar quite in the model of, say, William O. Douglas, one of the associate justices on the court, or Louis Brandeis, the guy that uh, William O. Douglas replaced. But what he did bring to the court was this idea that everybody should get a fair shake, and that the fundamental, one of the fundamental, perhaps the fundamental feature of our system is that it has to be, uh, is fairness, is that everyone has to get a fair crack at things. And even if we don't like them, necessarily. Toward the end of this talk, we'll talk about some of the people who we might not like uh, and the importance of giving them a fair shake. Because that's what our system requires, right? That's the important thing about our system. So the way you judge a system is, or one important way maybe, I, you could probably think of some others, but does it treat people fairly? Does it give everybody a fair crack at things, irrespective of what socioeconomic class they come from, what ethnic group they happen to be from, and the like. Um, and Earl Warren, even when you disagree with some of the things that he says, it helps to kind of look at his, the larger picture of Earl Warren and say, well, to what extent did the decisions that he was involved in, the actions that he was involved in, express this ideal of fairness? And so, Boy Scout. Earl Warren was born in 1898 in Bakersfield, California. This is a picture of Bakersfield from a couple of years before that, but I don't think that they had paved over the main drag 
by the time he was born. Bakersfield was a pretty dusty town in Central California. The, pra, the biggest employer there, I'm pretty sure, was the Southern Pacific Railroad, uh, for which Warren's father, Matthias, uh, was a mechanic for many years. Matthias had been born in, Matthias, whose original last name was Varen, was born in Stavanger in Norway, had emigrated to the United States, moved to, I want to say Minnesota, although with someone from Stavanger, Minnesota's a pretty good bet. Um, <laughs> Garrison Keillor once joked that Scandinavians moved to Minnesota because the sort of sandy, rocky soil reminded of them of the, of the sandy, rocky soil in their homeland, forgetting for a moment that that was actually the original reason that they had left their homeland in the first place. If you want to hang around later, I know a wealth of Scandinavian jokes, but I won't tell them now. So uh, Matthias moved to Bakersfield in 1889. He and his wife had their first child, or their second, their first child, his older sister Ethel, uh, predated him, and then he was born in 1896, they moved to Bakersfield, excuse me. Um, Earl Warren didn't have a middle name, and uh, his father later said, when you were born, I was too poor to afford one. <laughs> uh, there's another picture of Bakersfield once again. Any of you who've spent time out on the West Coast, this, I look at this and I think that's really not that far away from how downtown Portland looked when I first moved there in 1986. So, This is the Warren family. You can see Earl up there in the corner. Uh, there are his parents, Matthias, and uh, I believe his mother was named Crystal. And then, of course, they have a typically gigantic brood. My, my wife's family are uh, Norwegians and Danes, and they, she showed me a picture one time of their sort of extended family. This, these, these, they went to, came over from Denmark and then went to Spokane, which was another place, once again, that I think reminded them of, of the old country. And the picture is about that wide <laughs> with, with all their extended family. After graduating from high school, Warren went to the University of California, Berkeley, where, as in high school, he was a pretty average student. I mean, Earl Warren is one of those guys who really gives hope to the B students of this world. He really was not one of these guys who covered himself in academic distinction. And as a matter of fact, uh, when he was first or second year student, he was living in a, in a sort of housing block called La Junta and with a bunch of other students. Older students sort of took him out to dinner and said, you know, you really need to pay a little more attention to what's going on here, you know, because you're not really paying very good attention to your, uh, to your studies. Uh, after he graduated, he uh, attended uh, Bolt Hall, which is the law school at the University of California, Berkeley. It was fairly new in those days, and California was such, fixed in such a way that when you graduated from Bolt Hall, you just got, you just joined the bar. You didn't have to take, there wasn't an exam. You, you, you were just a lawyer then, because frankly, if you'd spent, you know, three, four years at Bolt Hall, you were as qualified as anyone else. Why not? Varn was a, uh, Varn, I called him Varn. Warren was, uh, in those days, he was sort of progressive. Uh, that is to say, he was a, uh, a supporter of Robert La Follette, the Wisconsin senator who was the, the sort of leading figure in early 20th century progressivism which was associated with the Republican Party very often. I mean, it's very interesting that, so uh, Earl Warren was a lifelong Republican, but he was associated with a, a wing of the Republican Party, which has been pretty thoroughly extirpated by this point. I say this point, I mean now. Uh, back then, progressives like La Follette, Hiram Johnson, the governor of California, or Teddy Roosevelt could all sort of coexist together, Teddy Roosevelt, who... Uh, won the presidency on the Republican ticket, later sort of moved away from them. But anyway, uh, so yeah, 1914, he graduates from Bolt Hall, uh, gets a job. His, he graduated, and his father was expecting that he was going to go back to Bakersfield, uh, to which he politely said no. I think he didn't think that the prospects were that great in Bakersfield, and who can really blame him? No slam on Bakersfield, but when, I mean, I think he saw the Bay Area as, a, as the place where things were really happening in California, and he was not wrong. He took a position with the Associated Oil Company in San Francisco, but he became kind of disgusted with the corruption, and this is going to be a theme that you hear a lot in the early part of this talk. California was still the Wild West in those days. I mean, you could argue about how much corruption California even up to the present day, but 
But in those days, there was a lot of corruption, and he, in his sort of early legal career, was kind of grossed out by it. Uh, 1917, so three years later, the United States enters the First World War. Warren volunteers for an officer training camp. He was rejected because he had a bad case of hemorrhoids. I feel sad saying this out loud, but it's so bad that he had to have surgery to fix them. He ends up becoming a trainer, a, a close combat trainer, and he remains a member of the Army Reserve until 1934, rising to the rank of captain. In 1918, he goes back to Oakland. He becomes the legislative, legislative assistant to a member of the California Assembly. Then he's appointed the clerk of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. And then he's hired as the deputy district attorney for Alameda County. And this is really the start of what his life becomes. 1924 presidential election, he votes for La Follette in the, in the, uh, the Progressive Party candidate. He also serves as the campaign manager for Frank Anderson, who was an assemblyman and a Republican. And that was his first real foray into politics. By the way, Earl Warren... I believe is the last member of the Supreme Court to have actually held elected office. Um, I mean, there haven't been any since then. It's kind of hard to imagine, given what getting electoral office involves in this country now, that you would then be seen as fit for the Supreme Court, but that's another issue entirely. Eventually, he, in 1925, is appointed Alameda County District Attorney. He was a real crusading figure. There was a lot of corruption. There was also, especially with the bail bondsmen, the bail bondsmen would, and the, and the district attorneys would, had a sort of backhand relationship about who got to bail out which client. There was, there was money being passed. Also, a lot of the, the, the assistant DAs were doing most of their stuff in private practice and devoting less than their, I mean, being a DA in Alameda County in those times, and in a lot of California, was a part-time job and often was turned out to be a way to sort of promote your, uh, your own personal law practice. In the 1920s, he vigorously enforced prohibition, although he did like to have a tipple every now and then. Although not during prohibition, apparently. In 1927, he launches an investigation of the sheriff, the county sheriff, Burton Becker, and after a trial that was described in the press as the most sweeping expose of graft in the history of the country, never one for understatement, people in the press. Becker was convicted in 1930. And this was not the only conviction of public officials. He, Warren, participated, prosecuted one of his investigators for forcing a confession out of somebody. And he told his investigators, I don't want you to, to, to use what we would now call enhanced interrogation techniques and the reason was because he wanted everything done above board and by the book. He had a, a, a very pronounced sense of justice, a very pronounced sense of fairness. And he thought that if, you, if we weren't, if the, if the good guys aren't following the rules, I mean, of course, the bad guys aren't following the rules. If they were, they wouldn't be the bad guys. But the good guys have to follow the rules. And that's, that's a defining feature of his, of his work. 1931... He comes in first in a nationwide poll of law enforcement officials uh, and was called the most intelligent and politically independent district attorney in the United States. The 1930s and the onset of the Great Depression led to uh, a lot of economic misery in the Bay Area, also a lot of political agitation, particularly from the far left. There was a general strike in 1927. This is before the beginning. Um, Warren prosecuted a woman in Whitney versus California in 1927 for attending a communist meeting in Oakland. This was sort of the era of the Red Scare. By the way, and apropos of nothing, there's a really interesting series of books that have come out, one by Rachel Maddow, one by, I can't remember the other guy's name, Nazis of Copley Square, the, the author's name will come to me, about the Hitler supporters who tried to stage a, uh, a pro-Hitler coup in 1940, but that's another issue. Um, but the, the 1930s and 1940s were a time of a lot of agitation at both the sort of extreme ends of the, of the spectrum, let's just say. Warren becomes the leader of the uh, California Republican Party. 
Uh, he serves as the county chairman for Herbert Hoover's 1932 campaign. He really believed in Hoover. He was maybe the last person in the United States that really believed in Hoover. <laughs> he was not a huge fan of the New Deal, as you might expect, uh, which he described as leading to some sort of like, as kind of, I mean, in, in terms of totalitarianism, although the term totalitarianism had not come around quite at that point. 1936, he campaigned on behalf of Republican nominee Alf Landon, also unsuccessfully. Uh, here are some pictures of, there's this Earl Warren for District Attorney of Alameda County. This is the old Alameda County Courthouse. There's him working as a DA. Vote for Earl Warren for Attorney General. Keep experience in public office. Humanity first. I like that as a slogan. Humanity first. That's the newer Alameda County Courthouse in a more sort of Art Deco style, finished in 1934. In 1936, he was involved in a very high-profile murder case. That, there was a fellow named George Alberts, who was the chief engineer of a freighter called the Point Lobos. Uh, he was found dead in his bunk, and it turned out that he had been subject to the ministrations of a group associated with the Longshoremen's Union, which was sometimes referred to as the Beef Squad. And the, the, the operative theory being that he was sort of anti-union, there he is, uh, and they had sent some guys to uh, settle up with him and they had killed him. The guy who did it was never really caught, but Warren went to prosecute these three guys, Frank Connor, Earl King, and Ernest Ramsey, who were union officials who he said had organized the whole thing. Now you can kind of see that this is the workers' defender or you could, because the, the caption of the picture is the Alameda frame-up victims. The, the problem was that they couldn't put any of these guys in the right place at the right time. Although it was clear, I mean, they had some testimony from Sakovitz was the name of the guy who actually did it. Sakovitz uh, made himself scarce. But it was, it was argued that, that they had been sort of in the neighborhood and that Connor had sort of given the signal for the whole thing to go ahead. As it turned out, and this is another interesting thing about Warren, one of his assistants, there was a woman who was supposed to be on the, who was in the jury pool, and th there were some questions about her, I forget exactly what the, what the questions about her were, but where his assistant said, no, I think she should definitely be in the jury. And then later it turned out that not only did Ware know her, but that he had, had had some like financial dealings with her, which of course should have disqualified her from being in the jury pool. So Warren himself took part in the prosecution of this. And once again, you know, he got out and said, look, I'm not anti-union, but unions don't murder people. So clearly I'm, I'm anti these guys, right? And I think that, you know, once again, this is part of Warren's sort of fairness agenda coming to the fore. 1934, two years earlier, he had been involved in, a, in a, uh, the passage of a ballot measure that made the Attorney General, he was at that point the Attorney General of California, a full-time position. And once again, this is to professionalize the Attorney General's office, right? So what you had before was the Attorney General working on a kind of a part-time basis, but also having his own private legal practice. And that's not, I mean, it's a conflict of interest just in the sense that you want the Attorney General devoting his full attention to the legal problems of the state of California. Oh, this, was, this was still while he was the Alameda DA because it's, in 38 he's elected district attorney. That's where that placard comes from. Earlier in the 20th century, this is an interesting thing, and it's sort of neither here nor there, but uh, progressives had passed an amendment allowing for cross-filing. And cross-filing is you could enter the primary of any party or all of them. So, um, which, which tended to cement the power of incumbents. I think it's a weird, I've, I've never quite understood what their reason for doing this. But what it meant was that when Earl Warren ran for Attorney General, he ran in the primary for the Republicans and for the Democrats and for the progressives. And he won all three. I mean, imagine somebody doing that now. Like, that, that politician in the United States just doesn't exist, sadly enough. In 1938, his father was murdered. 
His parents had separated by that point. His mother had moved down to Oakland to live with him. His father had been, become a bit of a miser. Now, one unfortunate fact about being a miser, uh, on the old school theory of miser, is that you've hidden lots of your own money around your own house. Right? This is why you keep the money in the bank, right? Because when the crook comes to get it, they go to the bank, which is unfortunate, but, but probably less lethal for you than some guy coming in the back of the, the house, whacking you on the head with a lead pipe, and then looking for your dough. They arrested three suspects, eventually sort of whittled it down to one, but Warren told them, do not use any excess techniques to get a confession out of them. Everything has to be completely above board. And they were eventually, they couldn't uh, accumulate enough evidence, they were eventually released. And nobody was ever prosecuted for the crime. Every one of these guys that I've done has a sort of unfortunate dimension. With some of the earlier ones, it was with John Marshall, John Marshall Harlan. They had some unfortunate ideas about race, although John Marshall Harlan's were a lot less unfortunate than John Marshall's were. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, there's the, the very unfortunate Buck versus Bell decision in which he basically just trampled over Carrie Buck's human rights. 1941, December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor happens. And pretty quickly, a lot of very pronounced anti-Japanese sentiment develops in the United States. And Warren, uh, who at the time was organizing the state's civil defense program, really took part in this and was a really prominent proponent. He was not the person driving the uh, Japanese internment program but he was one of the prominent supporters of it. And just to put this in perspective, no Germans, we were just as much at war with Germans and Italians as we were with the Japanese, but they were not interned. Moreover, the Germans had already sunk at least one US destroyer prior to this, and also were prowling the seas, the Atlantic, sinking merchant shipping left and right. So, so the Japanese were really singled out in a very unfortunate and, and inappropriate way and, and very damaging to their community. Many lost their businesses, lost their homes, were forced to live in these camps. I mean, if, I, if any of you have ever visited one of these camps, you'll know what I mean. They were not in very nice places. George Takei, who played Mr. Sulu on the original Star Trek, did a really beautiful graphic novel about what his life was like in the years that he spent in one of these internment camps. And it's really... It's really quite moving and, and very sad. Warren, by 1944, came around to the idea that it was a bad idea, although the courts were coming around to it, too. There was a series of legal cases surrounding this. Um, but even toward the end of the war, he, and, and for years afterward, he refused to express any regret, even though he was repeatedly asked to by Japanese members of the Japanese community. Toward the end of his life, he kind of reconsidered, and I think that this is worth remembering. Because, in fact... It was a realization that was, that was late in coming, but the, the capacity to admit that you're wrong when you're wrong is, is probably one of, the, you know, one of the most important human characteristics. 1972, he was doing an oral history interview in which he said, I feel that everybody who had anything to do with the relocation of the Japanese after it was all over had something of a guilty conscience about it and wanted to show that it wasn't racial, a racial thing as much as a defense matter. In the course of the interview, he was shown pictures of uh, Japanese children separated from their parents and, and broke down weeping. They had to stop the interview until he could get back together. In his posthumously published memoirs, which I, I commend to you all, it's re really interesting, he wrote, I have since deeply regretted the removal order and my own testimony in advocating it because it was not in keeping with our American concept of freedom and the rights of citizens. Whenever I thought about the innocent little children who were torn from home, school friends, and congenial surroundings, I was conscience stricken. It was wrong to react so impulsively without positive evidence of disloyalty, even though we felt we had a good motive in the security of our state. It demonstrates the cruelty of war when fear, get tough military psychology, propaganda, and racial antagonism combine with one's responsibility for public security to produce such acts. Now, once again, it's important to realize there was no due process applied to these people. There was no evidence they were engaged in any sort of anti, you know, pro-Japanese activities. Some of them became pro-Japanese after they got sent to the camp. 
But many of them, many of the younger ones, joined the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, one of the most, if not the most, uh, heavily decorated units in the American Armed Forces in the Second World War, including 12 winners of the Medal of Honor. So yeah, that's an unfortunate thing worth remembering. And, and once again, you know, very much at odds with, and I think later Warren realized this, very much at odds with his fundamental beliefs, which is everybody's, there's a reason we have the procedures. There's a reason why you have to have due process. The Constitution, you have to take the Constitution's uh, insistence on due process and the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments seriously. In the 1948 presidential campaign, Warren ran as Thomas Dewey's vice president, vice presidential candidate. It was an unfortunate choice. Nobody liked Thomas Dewey. He was a very, I shouldn't say that, but there were probably plenty of people who liked him, but not many people who met him who weren't somehow related to him. He, was a, he was a, had, a, had a somewhat unfortunate personality. And then, of course, it ended up with this. And, you know... More power to Harry Truman. He really had, you know, Harry Truman, people forget that the way Harry Truman came to prominence once he got into Congress, I mean, he was a sort of a Missouri machine politician and had some unsavory connections, although he was a pretty straight arrow. But he, the, during the first years of the Second World War, of America's involvement in the Second World War, he was involved in a congressional committee <coughs> doing oversight of war spending. And he was really a very aggressive defender of the public purse uh, and did very important work. And this, I think, brought him to the kind of prominence that, you know, he was eventually put on the ticket. Roosevelt didn't, I think, really know who he was or or want to know. So that when, and I will just relate, this is one of my favorite uh, Harry Truman stories before we go further. When uh, Franklin Roosevelt died, Truman was called to the White House. Truman didn't know that that Roosevelt was out of town at the time. This is how out of the loop he was. And then they told him that he had died. And he went up to the private quarters in the White House to talk to Eleanor Roosevelt. And he said, you know, he offered his condolences. And then he said, is there anything I can do for you? And Eleanor Roosevelt, and this is the, the key, you know, a totally typical Eleanor Roosevelt response. She said, the question is, what can we do for you? Because you are the one who is in trouble now. She was, and she liked Truman. Uh, you know, Truman was a pretty plain-spoken guy. I think that if they had not been on opposite sides of the political fence, that Truman and, and Warren probably would have gotten along together because they were pretty, both pretty straightforward, straight-shooting characters. Not like, I mean, okay, I'm just going to divert for one second. Franklin Roosevelt I have immense respect for, but he was one of those guys who was very much prone to telling anybody he was in the room with what he figured they wanted to hear even if that person was Stalin. He, he, thought, he, could, he thought he could sort of soft-soap Stalin. This is, if, you wanna, if you wanna talk about who was the sort of more canny politician in between, Truman, or between Roosevelt and Churchill, you kind of had to say it was Churchill, because Churchill really understood that you, you couldn't really trust Stalin any further than you could throw him. Um, but that Churchill understood that once you knew what Stalin wanted, you could be pretty sure what he was gonna do. Whereas Roosevelt, to the end of his life, really thought that he could convince Stalin to be a better citizen, which was just not on the cards. So after Eisenhower is elected president, he offered Warren the position of solicitor general, uh, which he turned, which Warren turned down. Actually, he offered it to Dewey first. Who, yeah, Warren said, Dewey turned it down. Warren said yes, but before he, uh, but he also told Warren, I'm going to appoint you to the next opening on the Supreme Court. And that turned out to be the position of the, of the Chief Justice when Chief Justice Vinson died. Now, at that time, the Supreme Court had a very pronounced ideological cast because a large number of the sitting justices on the Supreme Court had been appointed by Franklin Roosevelt, who at one point also had entertained the idea when the, when the Supreme Court was, not, was sort of not going along with early New Deal measures that he would just like, start adding members to the Supreme Court until he got a composition that that he found more favorable. And by the way, there's no constitutional reason why he couldn't have done that. There's no, it's not specified in the Constitution how many Supreme Court justices, or even that there is going to be a Supreme Court, in, in fact. Well, not in the original 
in any case. But, um, and of course, if you remember the, the sort of John Marshall Harlan era, one of his first big cases was trying to establish the, the proposition that the Supreme Court should have any role in, in, in determining the constitutionality of congressional products, so to speak. So there's a sort of, there's two wings on the Supreme Court at this point. The kind of uh, activist wing that's led by uh, Hugo Black, William O. Douglas, and a sort of a more conservative wing uh, led by Felix Frankfurter, who Frankfurter's position was mostly, well, we should defer to Congress unless they do something that's obviously unconstitutional. Warren sort of aligned himself with the uh, more activist wing. Why? Because he's a reformer. Because what he thinks he's there to do is make the institutions work as they should work. And so his feeling is we need to make sure that the laws that get passed and the institutions that we have match up with our values, match up with our American values. For the balance of what we're going to talk about here, I'm going to just going to talk about some of the important cases that, that he was involved in. He didn't write all of these decisions, but he wrote most of them. Uh, he was a very good delegator. But the first case that, that came up in front of them, the first really major one, and one that really changed a lot of important things in this country, is Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka in 1954. 1951, the public school system in Topeka, Kansas, had refused to enroll local black resident Oliver Brown's daughter at a school, at the school closest to her home and insisted, interestingly enough, or ironically enough, if you want to put it that way, that she be bused to an all-black school further away. The Browns and 12 other families sued. Eventually, there were cases from, I think, four other states, Delaware, Virginia, the District of Columbia, that were sort of brought together in this, in this motion. When it comes for the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court rules unanimously uh, in favor of Brown. And the arguments went like this. This is a quote, some quotes from the decision which was written by Earl Warren. We come to the question presented, does segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race, even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors may be equal, deprive the children of the minority group of equal educational opportunities? We believe that it does. In Sweat v. Painter, in finding that it a segregated law school for Negroes, and sorry, I'm going to use the terms that are in the, the thing. Normally, now we wouldn't use that particular term, but, but I'm, you know, just by way of explanation. Could not provide them with equal educational opportunities. This court relied in large part on those qualities which are incapable of objective measurement, but which make for greatness in the law school. In McLaurin v. Oklahoma State Regents, the court, in requiring that a Negro admitted to a white graduate school be treated like all the other students, again resorted to the intangible considerations, quote, his ability to study, to engage in discussions and exchange views with other students, and in general to learn his profession. Such considerations apply with added force to children in grade and high schools. To separate them from others of similar age and qualifications solely because of their race generates a feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. The effect of this separation on their educational opportunities was well, was well stated by a finding in the Kansas case by a court which nevertheless felt compelled to rule against the Negro plaintiffs. Quoting from the, the court in the Kansas case, segregation of white and colored children in public schools has a detrimental effect upon the colored children. The impact is greater when it is the sanction of the law for the policy of separating the races is usually interpreted as denoting the inferiority of the Negro group. A sense of inferiority affects the motivation of a child to learn. Segregation with the sanction of the law, therefore, has a tendency to retard the educational and mental development of the Negro children and to deprive them of some of the benefits that they would receive in a racially integrated school system. Whatever may have been the extent the psychological knowledge at the time of Plessy v. Ferguson, and this is, once again, a direct rejection of Plessy v. Ferguson, the idea that, that separate but equal is okay. Any language in Plessy v. Ferguson contrary to this finding is rejected. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. 
Therefore, we hold that the plaintiffs and others similarly situated for whom the actions have been brought here by reason of the segregation complained of, deprived of their equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. This disposition makes unnecessary any discussion whether such segregation also violates the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. So basically they're saying it's, it's not even a due process issue, it's just an, it's a straight up equal protection issue because if you're put in, an, in a segregated school clearly because of your race, the implication that you are somehow inferior is inescapable and damaging to a child. Now, what they did not address in this case or in a, in a case that, that followed on from it in 1955 is what exactly could be done to fix it. And many schools in the Deep South decided to uh, close down and offer only private education or the South engaged in a, in a policy that was referred to as massive resistance. Finally, in 1958, the Cooper versus Aaron decision in the Supreme Court once again reaffirmed that separate but equal couldn't be, a, couldn't be a, a legitimate basis on which to organize education. Uh, and eventually, I mean, we all know the history, the, you know, the protests on the school steps, which are, which are I think, quite unfortunate. Um, now, we can look at this and be like, oh, you know, this is definitely a step forward for American civilization, I think, just in the respect that how does the fundamental document of the country start? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So if we're going to take that seriously, and if we're going to take the 14th Amendment seriously, then we need to take account of the actual effects of the way the institutions play out on, on the human beings who are involved in them. Then we get to like busing in the 19, 1960s and 70s, and there was a riot down in Little Italy about this. I mean, people were, there was riots in Boston about it too. And so the question is, given that the goal is not legally sanctioned segregation, this is, by the way, what segregation looked like in the United States in 1954. Segre legal s school segregation was required in all the red colored states. Uh, and was optional in the blue colored states and was forbidden in the green colored states. This is kind of illustrates one of the sort of complexities of, of the way the Supreme Court operates in our system, right? Okay, we can't have separate but equal. We can't have segregated schools. That's great. How are we going to overcome the fact that institutionally the people tend to live in separate places, right? So, but it's a complex issue and one that was, I think, pretty unequivocally resolved in terms of its ethical and legal dimensions. 1963, Gideon v. Wainwright, I'm not going to go into huge depth about this, except that to say that this is a kind of a, an interesting hero story. This fellow, Clarence Earl Gideon, was seen leaving a pool room in Panama City, Florida, carrying a bottle of wine, some Coca-Cola, and with his pockets full of change. And he was accused of having robbed the place. The place had been robbed. He was accused. Uh, he couldn't, he was indigent, he couldn't afford an attorney. The following exchange appeared when he appeared, or occurred when he appeared before a judge. Court, Mr. Gideon, I'm sorry, but I cannot appoint counsel to represent you in this case. Under the laws of the state of Florida, the only time a court can appoint counsel to represent the defendant is when that person is charged with a capital offense. I'm sorry, but I will have to deny your request to appoint counsel to defend you in this case. Gideon responds, the United States Supreme Court says that I am entitled to be represented by counsel which is not exactly true at that point, although later it was, like, once this is, you know, two years later, when this case got up to the Supreme Court, it was true. The Supreme Court, this judgment was written by Douglas, although, by William O. Douglas, although Warren participated in its, in its composition. And, and this is another key, it goes back to Warren's work as the DA in Alameda County and the, and the district and the state's attorney in California, right? The defendant has to have access to a lawyer. In the judgment, they wrote, lawyers in criminal courts are necessities, not luxuries. The right of one charged with a crime to counsel may not be deemed to be fundamental or essential to fair trials in some countries, but it is in ours. From the very beginning, our state and national constitutions and laws have laid great emphasis on procedural, procedural and substantive safeguards designed to assure fair trials before impartial tribunals in which every defendant stands equal before the law. Why? 
you're innocent until proven guilty, you get the same crack at coming out successfully through the courts as somebody who's rich enough to afford an attorney. In practice, we can argue about what that means, but um, <laughs> this noble idea cannot be realized if the poor man is charged poor man charged with a crime has to face his accusers with the, without a lawyer to assist him. A defendant's need for a lawyer is nowhere better stated than in the moving words of Mr. Justice Sutherland in Powell v. Alabama. The right to be heard would be in many cases of little avail if it did not comprehend the right to be heard by counsel. Even the intelligent and educated layman has small and sometimes no skill in the science of law. If charged with a crime, he is capable generally of determining for himself whether the indictment he is incapable, generally, of determining for himself whether the indictment is good or bad. He is unfamiliar with the rules of evidence. Left without the aid of counsel, he may be put on trial without a proper charge and convicted upon incompetent evidence or evidence irrelevant to the issue or otherwise inadmissible. He lacks both the skill and knowledge adequately to prepare his defense, even though he have a perfect one. He requires the, guidance, the guiding hand of counsel at every step in the proceedings against him. Without it, though he be not guilty, he faces the danger of conviction because he does not know how to establish his innocence. There's a sort of interesting, this court with this case, he was assigned by the Supreme Court as his defense attorney, Abe Fortas, who was subsequently a Supreme Court justice uh, and a good friend of, uh, among others, Lyndon B. Johnson. And uh, Fortas made the following point. What does a lawyer do when, he's a, when he is accused of a crime? The first thing he does is goes and hire a lawyer. Any, if you've watched any significant amount of procedurals, you will have heard the, the old adage, the lawyer who represents himself as a fool for a client. And even Clarence Darrow, 1912, at that point, the most brilliant trial attorney in the world he was accused in a case of uh, jury tampering. What did he do? He hired a lawyer. He didn't represent himself. So if, all, if the lawyers acknowledge that hiring a lawyer to represent you is necessary, then it has to be, a, you know, that's a good argument that it's, that it's necessary for everybody. And we can look at it and say, well, maybe at times this, the consequence of this is that sometimes the guilty go free. But you have to look at it from the other perspective. I mean, the guilty going free is, is an unfortunate situation. The innocent going to jail is a much worse situation, right? That that's absolutely contradicts the fundaments of our system. And the innocent going to jail creates a lasting lack of faith in the, in the, in the fundaments of our system. So it's, you know, obviously we do want all the guilty getting what they have coming to them. But in this case, we have to look at the, the, the rights of the innocent and the situation of the innocent and make sure that they have the best shot of coming through the legal procedure unscathed. Heart of Atlanta Motel versus U.S., 1964. This happened several months after the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Heart of Atlanta Motel was a sort of motor inn in Atlanta. It was clear that it was... You know, it was stipulated by the, the uh, owners that they did a lot of trade with people coming off the highway. The owner, Morton Rolston, basically they would only, they, they stipulated that, it, that or they, they basically had the rule that they would only take white guests. The owner, a fellow named Morton Rolston, uh, argued that hotels uh, shouldn't fall under the, under Title II of the Civil Rights Act because... Now, okay, the thing you have to remember about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is that, I mean, okay, so if you were going to argue about equal rights, right, the first place that you would probably go if you thought about it was the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Equal Protection Clause basically says everybody gets equal protection under the law. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is founded on a somewhat tendentious reading of the Interstate Commerce Clause. The premise being, okay, so I'm a truck driver and I have to make a deli dis delivery down in the South. But if I'm black, I can't find a place to stay. So I'm not going to be able to make my delivery, right? Or I'm not going to you know, be able to find a facility to go, you know. Uh, so these laws allowing of uh, people to discriminate 
in these public facilities, hotels, restaurants, what have you, constitutes a restraint of trade. It's a weird thing to get your head around. I think it's probably correct in the Supreme Court. I mean, I think it, whatever, who cares what I think. But the Supreme Court <laughs> also thought that it was. Um, also, uh, Rolston argued that it violated his, his rights of due process under the, 15th, under the Fifth Amendment. And that, in a wholly bizarre piece of legal argumentation, that uh, it violated his 13th, 13th Amendment rights, uh, that forcing him to accept uh, African-American patrons was, uh, was uh, what the 13th Amendment defines as involuntary servitude. Um, Archibald Cox, the Solicitor General from the United States, is a very canny man, basically made the argument that I just made to you about interstate commerce. He brought up numerous examples of cases, such as uh, in Birmingham in spring of 1963, when the protests over racial discrimination, the, the rising of racial discrimination as an issue, had economic effects on the business community in, in Birmingham that were comparable to those wrought by the Depression. So in this respect, follow the, this is once again an, an issue of commerce. And in fact, in the decision, which was written by Warren, he quotes McCullough v. Maryland one of the great cases of John Marshall. The power of Congress over interstate commerce is not to be confined to the regulation of commerce among the states. It extends to those activities intrastate, within states, which so much affect interstate commerce or the exercise of the power of Congress over it so as to make regulation of them appropriate means to the attainment of a legitimate end, the exercise of power granted in the Constitution to regulate interstate commerce. So, once again, this reading of the Interstate Commerce Clause may seem a little weird on its face, right? And it may seem, I mean, this is part of, partly kind of the weird thing about jurisprudence, right? A lot of times things get decided on bases where you're just like, hmm, really, is that why? They also, the decision also ran as follows. Uh, the power of Congress to promote interstate commerce also includes the power to regulate the local incidents thereof, right? So people are driving on the interstate highway system and then they're staying at this hotel. That's basically who it's meant to serve. So by definition, that's commerce that involves going between two states. Thus, it's interstate commerce. A little bit tortured, but, but as far as they were concerned, it had a basis going all the way back to the revolutionary period. Uh, one need only examine the evidence which we've discussed above to see that Congress may, as it has, prohibit racial discrimination by motels serving travelers, however local their operations may appear, nor does the act deprive the appellant of liberty or property under the Fifth Amendment. The commerce power invoked by the Congress is a specific and plenary one authorized by the Constitution itself. The only questions are, one, whether Congress has a rational basis for finding that racial discrimination by motels affects commerce, and two, if it had such a basis, whether the means it selected to eliminate that evil are reasonable and appropriate. If they are, appellant has no right to select a guest he sees fit from the free from government regulation. We therefore conclude that the action of the Congress, the adoption of the act, is applied to the hotel, which conceitedly deserves inter serves interstate travelers, is within the power granted by the Commerce Clause of the Constitution as interpreted by this court for 140 years. It may be argued that Congress could have pursued other methods to eliminate the obstructions it found in interstate commerce caused by racial discrimination. But, it is a matter of but this is a matter of policy that rests entirely with the Congress, not with the courts. So once again, what is the, the court really only can, the court can't say, well, you should have found another way to do this. The court can only say, this comports with the Constitution or it doesn't. And in this case, they were finding that Although the, the reasoning could be looked at as being a little tortuous, for 140 years, the courts had viewed the Interstate Commerce Clause as, as relating to, to this particular issue. It is subject only to one caveat, that the means chosen by it must be reasonably adapted to the end permitted by the Constitution. Once again, whatever is permitted, the, the government is permitted to do, it is also permitted 
as, as Alexander Hamilton argued at, at incredible length, to, to use whatever means uh, it needs to do so, as long as those means are not explicitly forbidden by the Constitution. We cannot say that this choice here was not so adapted. The Constitution requires no more. Now we get into something that I think is really the, the meat of this, and sorry I'm going on so long, but I find these cases really fascinating. I've been really boring my coworkers by telling them every blessed thing that I've discovered about this. Griswold v. Connecticut, 1965, and this is, this is a key thing. This is, in 1879, Connecticut passed a law that banned the use of any drug, medical device, or other instrument for furthering contraception, or doctors for discussing it with their patients. There had been an earlier case, Poe v. Ullman, 1961, in which two couples, one of whom the wife had had three miscarriages, so she wanted to be allowed to use contraception because she wanted to have sex with her husband and not risk having another miscarriage, and another woman for whom pregnancy was, her doctors had told her would be, would be a danger to her life. So they sued, the court rejected their suit, the Supreme Court rejected their suit, and the argument was that because the law was not being enforced, that is to say they hadn't been charged with violating the law, that the court couldn't grant anticipatory relief. To which John Marshall Harlan II, who was on the, the grandson of the original John Marshall Harlan, who was actually a relatively conservative guy, said, well, that's kind of weird that you... <laughs> that the only way you can challenge a law is by breaking it and then taking your chances to see if, you know, like, oops, <laughs> guess that was a mistake. Uh, in Harlan's dissent, in, so Harlan dissented from the decision in Poe v. Ullman, 1961. Do pr and this is, this is a key point, and it gets referenced in the subsequent adjudication of Griswold. Due process has not been reduced to any formula. It cannot be determined by reference to any code. The best that can be said of it, the best that can be said is that through the course of this court's decisions, it has represented the balance which our nation, built upon postulates of respect for the liberty of the individual, has struck between that liberty and the demands of organized society. If the supplying of the content to this constitutional concept has of necessity been a rational process, it certainly has not been one where judges have felt free to roam where unguided speculation might take them. The balance of which I speak is the balance struck by this country, having regard to what history teaches are the traditions from which it developed, as well as the traditions from which it broke. The tradition is a living thing. A decision of this court which radically departs from it could not long survive, while a decision which builds on what has survived is likely to be sound. No formula could serve as a substitute in this area for judgment and restraint. It is this outlook which has led the court continuously, continually to perceive distinctions in the imperative character of constitutional provisions such, as the, such that character, since that character must be discerned from a particular provision particular provisions larger context. Inasmuch as this context is one not of words but of history and purposes, the full scope of the liberty guaranteed by the due process clause cannot be found in or limited by the precise, precise terms of the specific guarantees elsewhere provided in the Constitution. This liberty does, is not a series of isolated points pricked out in terms of taking of property, the freedom of speech, press, and religion, the right to keep and bear arms, the freedom from unreasonable searches and, se and seizures, and so on. It is a rational continuum, which broadly speaking includes a freedom from all substantial arbitrary impositions and purposeless restraints, which also recognizes what a reasonable and sensitive judgment must that as what a reasonable and sensitive judgment must that certain interests require particularly careful scrutiny of the state needs asserted to justify their abridgment. Okay, what he's referring to this is what's often referred to as substantive due process. And it refers, the, the Griswold v. Connecticut, he doesn't refer to it explicitly here in, in Poe v. Ullman, but Griswold v. Connecticut refers to the Ninth Amendment. It's often forgotten. The Ninth Amendment says, and the Ninth Amendment is, is quite short and reads as follows, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Right? So this is a key thing to remember. 
that just because the Constitution expl doesn't explicitly say you have a certain right, doesn't mean that you don't have that right. And actually, when the framers were debating the Bill of Rights, one of the arguments against the Bill of Rights was, well, if we add this thing to it, then people will think that these are the only rights that you have. Whereas the Constitution guarantees that the assertion of a right will get a sort of rational consideration, uh, balancing it against the values of the community and the needs of the state, right? So think about, once again, what I was talking about at the beginning, rights that you feel like you have that are not enumerated in the Constitution. The right to have your, you know, the right to educate your children and make choices about your children's education. The Constitution says nothing about that. The right to travel between states. The right to depart from this country if you should so choose. That's not, the Constitution says nothing about that. The right to privacy. And however you think of the right to privacy as being construed, I think we all think we have it. Right? So we don't think that our lives should just be an open book to whoever, especially not the government. And it's not that you have anything to hide, necessarily. It's that we don't want to be looked at. We want to have that, 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 that element of privacy as a civilized society. So what Harlan is saying here is that what the court is meant to be doing is balancing these things. But just because the Constitution doesn't explicitly say, and that's what Griswold has decided on. Griswold has decided on the privacy of the marital relationship. So if you, as a married couple, want to have, want to use contraception, that's a decision that you need to make between you. The government doesn't have a compelling, overriding interest in preventing you from doing it. Now, you could also argue that this could also be an equal protection thing, right? Because the consequence of not using contraception can be a lot more burdensome to the woman than it can be for the man in ways that I will not enumerate because you're all adults, most of you. Um, but so because there's this differential consequence, the rights of the, of the woman have to be protected. They didn't argue this way in Griswold. I'm just saying that, but this is an example of how constitutional thinking happens. Miranda v. Arizona. This is the last one I'm going to talk about at length. 1966, the Nixon administration is involved in this like big anti-crime push. And they feel like things are going all right. Why? Because the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is a former district attorney. I mean, who would you assume had, you know, sympathy with the anti-crime project? This fellow, Ernesto Miranda, was arrested in 1963, questioned by police uh, in a case of kidnapping and rape. After two hours of interrogation, the police obtained a written con confession. Miranda was found guilty. He appealed to the Supreme Court of Arizona because he had not been given a lawyer. The Supreme Court of Arizona said, well, did you ask for a lawyer? He said, no. They said, well, Tough luck. It was appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court granted certiori. That means granted relief. This was a 5-4 decision, and Warren, the ex-prosecutor, delivered the opinion in which they found in favor of Miranda. And Warren explicitly says in the judgment, I don't think that it puts too much burden on the police to give people who are arrested the rights that the Constitution specifies they have, that is to say, and, and to inform them of that. So this is a guy who's a former prosecutor, so he's not some milk toast, criminal loving, you know, public defender. He's a guy who's, who's prosecuted a lot of people. So Miranda's com conviction is thrown out. It's sent back. He's tried again. This time they get plenty of evidence against him, and he gets convicted because he's guilty. But, <laughs> but the point is worth making, right? And once again, look at, at, at the character of Warren, right? This is Warren saying, this guy's a bad guy, probably, but that's the, even the bad guys get constitutional rights because the, our system is more important 
than this guy, right? Our system, that, that our system manifests justice is more important. We have to follow our own rules because that's what makes us good. Being good is having rules and following them. If we don't follow the rules, then we become like the rule breakers, right? What separates us ethically from them? Miranda was, uh, uh, did 10 years uh, and then was released. He spent the balance of his life earning money by signing the warrant cards, <laughs> signing the Miranda cards. This is an example of it, of various uh, policemen in, uh, in Arizona. Uh, Loving v. Virginia, once again, this is substantive due process, although it's adjudicated on, this is uh, equal protection. So, by the way, some of the current Supreme Court justices on the sort of right end, particularly Alito and, and uh, Clarence Johnson, uh, Clarence Thomas, excuse me, Clarence Thomas, have basically voiced the opinion that substantive due process isn't a thing uh, and that everything should be re-adjudicated. I think that's... A, a recipe for anarchy personally, but they're in a position, theirs are, their opinions matter a lot more than mine. But the, one of the ironies here is that, I mean, see, people point this out, like Clarence Thomas is in an interracial marriage. Now, of course, and as a friend of mine pointed out, and this is the, the correct take on this, loving is pri primarily adjudicated on equal protection, not on substantive due process. But once again, the right to marry who you want to marry as long as it's a consenting adult Constitution says nothing about that. I mean, and how would you like it if the state of Ohio made a rule saying, well, um, before you marry, you have to sort of submit uh, an account of yourself and, and, and will decide whether that's an appropriate thing. You wouldn't want to do that. Divorce. What? Less divorce. Well, <laughs> yeah, but less marriage, too. Uh, get much less. Yeah, I mean... There's that too, but I mean, first of all, consenting adults who, who, here's an idea, I try not to preach politics from the lectern, but here's an idea you should think about. Why don't we get the state out of the marriage business? Like, what does the state add, think of all of you who've been married, what, what did the state add to that? $50? The, yeah. well, right, right. <laughs> no, they subtracted it. Yeah. That, that, that's subtraction. Um, in the, you know, and there's, I think there's a good, you know, there's a good sort of Christian basis for this in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the early church, basically getting married was a matter of just saying we're married now. Now there's some complications with this. This is just a sort of think about it idea, but, but I'm all for getting the state out of, out of marriage. Cause what does it really add to the, to the whole thing? This is the last case I'm going to talk about and then I will finish up. Sorry for going so long. I would be remiss uh, if I didn't talk about Brandenburg v. Ohio, 1969. If you want to talk about some people who are really, I think, repugnant to any civilized conception of, of society, that would be the Ku Klux Klan. Basically, uh, the, the grand wizard of the local clan down, in, down by Cincinnati, I love this, called up a local newspaper reporter and said, hey, we're having a rally. You want to come out? And... Uh, so he said, sure, and he showed up. Um, this, is a, this is one, I, I think this is in Indiana. This is a, not actually the, the rally in question, although, I mean, I, I'm guessing one Klan rally is like another. I've never been to one, so um, we'll, you'll just have to take my word for it. But at this Klan rally, the guy sort of advocated, didn't sort of, advocated overthrowing the government. Well, that's a crime. <laughs> At least by the standards of, excuse me? I said, is it really? Well, it is, it, it, it was then. So he was, he was uh, prosecuted. And this is how that shook out. This gets back to a decision that, that Oliver Wendell Holmes had been involved in, which established what's called the clear and present danger standard. What the Warren Court said was that this stuff is covered by free speech Unless there's some immediate possibility that it's going to be put into practice. So I'm allowed to say, hey, let's, go over, let's overthrow the government. What I'm not allowed to say is, hey, let's all get together, go over to the state house and overthrow the government like right now. Go get your guns. We're heading down there. Um, 
And that's the distinction. Once again, this is a fair play thing. And I think, you know, so what the Warren court is doing and what Warren is doing as a, as a judge is, is saying, look, no sane person likes the Klan. But, and, and this talk of overthrowing the government, that's not okay either, right? That's, our system is based on not overthrowing the government when you disagree with it, but by changing the government through an electoral process. You don't like what the government is doing? Get your friends together, go down to the polling place on voting day and throw the bums out. That's how we do things. It may not be perfect, but it's, our, it's, it's the least worst way of doing it. Let's just put it that way. Democracy is the worst form of government known to man, except for all the other ones. Um, so, and, and this I kind of like about Warren. I don't, you know, you know, I don't like the Klan. I think there are a bunch of racists, also anti-Semites, also anti-Catholic. Um, but what they do deserve is the protection of the law. And the protection of the law says, you have freedom of speech, that freedom of speech is limited. You can't shout fire in a crowded theater. And you can't, you know, use that speech to get people together to go do crimes right now. But if you're talking about it in the abstract, the Constitution says that that's okay, even though we sitting here might find it repugnant, okay? And that's, once again, this is Warren's Boy Scout nature coming through. So Warren serves on the court till 1973. Uh, he's uh, replaced by uh, Warren Berger, at which point the, car, the court shifts pretty noticeably to the right and becomes more politicized, I think. I mean, this is the thing you have to say about the Warren court. You can, you can like what they, what they did or you can dislike what they did, but they were the last court that I think really contained a lot of deep legal thinkers. I mean, I don't think that the, the current court necessarily has a lot of really deep legal minds, with some exceptions. And I don't think that that's, it's, it's not a political thing, because I think it's the general quality of the court. I mean, I think John Roberts is mostly trying to keep the thing from flying apart at the, at the seams. And I, you know, I, I have a certain sympathy for John Roberts on that basis because I can't imagine what the, what, the, what the committee discussions must be like with so many people who just fundamentally disagree with each other. But, um, so you can look at the Warren Court and say, well, it's kind of an activist court, right? Like it, it, you know, it really is promoting this idea of substantive due process. But what it's doing is promoting it because of a coherent idea of fairness. And does it get to that every time? No. But that's at the root of our system, right? Our system is, is not perfect. Uh, it's not the lot of any human system to be perfect. But if you're going to have a fundamental value in politics and in law, the idea of giving everybody a fair shake is probably, you could do a lot worse. And that, if you want to talk about the thing that defined the career of Earl Warren and his time on the court. And if you want to talk about the long arc of the development of law in this country, that I think is something that you could point to as a way that we've made progress. Uh, and built on the, the positive achievements of the founding generation of the United States. So, that was really long. <laughs> Sorry. But thank you for your time. I'll see you guys next time.